That was how low I'd got. My time was up, basically. About 10 in the morning, sitting on the end of my bed and being like, I can't do this anymore because if I, if I carry on, I'm going to die. Welcome back to Crisis What Crisis, the podcast that aims to guide you towards a more resilient life and whatever it might throw at you. If this is your first time with us, then do please hit subscribe wherever you're watching or listening. It really does help make sure that these, I hope, useful conversations are shared as widely as possible. Today, I'm joined by the force of nature, that is Bryony Gordon, journalist, author, presenter, podcaster, mental health campaigner, marathon runner, cold water swimmer. There's nothing this woman cannot do. That she's done it all whilst dealing with demons that would put a break, to put it mildly, on most of us is testament to her resilience, her work ethic and her bravery. And as the founder of the charity Mental Health Mates, Bryony has delivered on her mission to change the debate around mental health. She continues to have strong views on this crisis uh, that we face in this country, including when it comes to the services that are available or too often not available for young people who are struggling. Ten years on from writing for the first time about her battles with mental illness and addiction, Bryony has now written a brilliant new book, Mad Woman, a no-holds-barred, honest and exposing analysis of her struggles, both physical and mental, including extreme OCD, known as Pure O, binge eating and severe anxiety. It's a book about crisis of the most personal kind, written in a way that is as helpful as it is compassionate. Bryony Gordon. Welcome to Crisis What Crisis. So that's a lovely introduction. How are you doing? I'm good. Yes. How's the training going? I mean, it's going, is what I will say. I'm, I, I am, obviously this is a podcast, right? but I'm taped up. My legs are sort of covered in... No, you're on film, Brani. So oh, OK. Yeah, yeah. I can flash my, <laughs> I can flash my legs for the people watching on. Mm-hmm. So I am not an athlete. Um, I'm a size sort of 18 to 20. And... Um, but running has been, exercise generally has been quite transformational for my mental health. And the moment I started doing exercise for the way it made me feel rather than the way it made me look was a sort of watershed moment, if you will. And I've since done a couple of marathons. I've done triathlons. I've done silly things like 10, 10 Ks in 10 days. The organisation Mental Health Mates, um, was born out of you sort of identifying a gap, right? Mm. I mean, it was a, it was which is a is something that you talk about more broadly, right? In terms of the services that we have currently around mental uh, illness in this mm. country, which I want to get into in a bit more detail. But you'd spotted something there that you just th- thought, well, this, this, this isn't this isn't readily available. It's not. I was, it's, it's not accessible at the moment. No, so it was. I mean, it was born out of desperation, really, because. I was really unwell. I was having my umpteenth episode of OCD and I was out, uh, you know, I'd heard that exercise was good for my mental health and I was desperate. I was totally desperate, you know, and I, like a lot of people with mental health issues, I had my only form of medication, of like my only treatment for them was alcohol and drugs, you Mm. know. And that doesn't work, (laughs) spoiler alert. And I remember I was out running or kind of jogging on Clapham Common near where I live. And I was listening to this podcast um, about this writer called Carson McCullers, who wrote this beautiful book called The Heart is a Lonely Hunter. And she tried to take her life many times and she sadly died of alcoholism in her 50s. But there was this archive audio footage of her and she said, sometimes it feels like everyone is part of a we except for me. And that stop me in my tracks because mm. that's exactly what mental illness felt like to me and I was there on Clapham Common and you know huffing and puffing and I looked out and I saw all these groups of people exercising together so you had like people playing football mums pushing buggies together and then the really strange you know the people doing military fitness <laughs> and I thought <laughs> if we hear we hear this statistic all the time, which is one in four people will experience a mental health issue each year. So in my field of vision, there was probably like 10 people who were going to experience this. Mm. And yet there was nothing, nothing where people could come together. You know, there's this CBT, you know, hidden therapy that, you know, you could kind of access in a shadowy, shadowy way through your GP if it was available. 
but there was nothing. And so I kind of, I had this idea. I was like, what about walks for people with mental health issues? Because we know that getting out is good for your, for your head. For me, all of my issues want me locked inside. They want me locked. They want me by myself in my bed because that's where they can thrive. I've always said this, the thing that all mental illnesses have in common is that they thrive by lying to you and by telling you that you're a freak and by telling you that you're alone and by telling you that no one's going to understand what you're going through. And that's just not true. And how about providing a space where you can start to kind of pierce through that lie that Mm. these things tell you. So I kind of ran home and I said to my husband, I've got this idea, I'm going to do these walks and I'm going to call it Mental Health Maze. And he said, these were his exact words, what if a load of nutters show up? And I was like, that's the point. I probably can't make that joke anymore. Um, But anyway, so I went on Twitter, as it was then known, and I was like, I'm going to be at this point in this park on at this time, and it was like a morning, Valentine's Day 2016. So yeah, so eight years ago, come along if you want to. And to my amazement, 20 people showed up. And it was just this lovely morning where people were walking around the serpentine and chatting about, you know, treatment and efficacy of antidepressants and all of those things in the same way that you might, mm. you know, football in the pub. And the thing about it was that because when you're walking forward, you're not looking at each other f- directly in the eye. It was just a lot easier it's a, it's for a people. Conv- yeah, yeah. 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 And so we did it again. And then people got in touch and were like, I'd like to do one in Leeds and some would like to do one in Manchester. And 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 here we are eight years later, and it's in 150 towns and cities across the UK. And we have the, all these incredible ward leaders. And what Mental Health Makes does now is it provides the training and the resources for people to set up their own walks in their own communities um, and get some kind of power and agency back over their own mental health. And Amazing. Yeah. Well, congratulations with it. Um, it would be a gross understatement to say that a mental illness uh, is an issue that's close to your heart. I think anyone who's listening to this is already getting the idea, I think. Um, but it's an issue that's dominated your life since you first developed OCD as a, as a young girl. Mm. Can you tell us, please, just give us a, uh, an idea of how it first manifested and, and what happened in those imme- that immediate period after? So OCD, I mean, so this was the... This was the early 90s um, and obviously there was absolutely no, there was no chat about mental health (laughs) at all. Um, And I remember I'd gone to like the smash hits poll winners party. That was, it was like the big thing and I was like 11 (laughs) or 12 and I just had the best time. And I remember, and I went to bed that night and I woke up the next morning and I'd had this dream that, um, that I was dying of this incurable disease. And I woke up and I was like, I'm dying of AIDS. At the time, there was this huge public, it's like very shaming public health campaign mm. about HIV and AIDS, which was, you know, it was massively stigmatizing of gay people. And, you know, it was it was pretty awful now I come to think about it. But I was a 12 year old girl, like, why would <laughs> it yeah, was but you were, you'd obviously absorbed but i'd obviously it absorbed and, yeah, it and yeah. i was i was i absolutely convinced andy that i was dying of aids and i started washing my hands and if i wasn't dying of aids there was something else i was going to get it so i started washing my hands obsessively until they bled and i slept with my um toothbrush under my pillow because I didn't want to infect my family and I had all these phrases I had to say that would in my mind sort of somehow protect everyone and myself from I don't know it's from a deadly illness and and it was and I remember thinking I remember it was like Christmas and I remember thinking this is going to be my last Christmas you know this is my last Christmas and and I couldn't believe it because I was so young and um so you talked to your your mum was the first person that you spoke to, but not until many happens. years later. Like many I, years later. Yeah, we're talking like five years so you later. You kept this inside for how long? Well, it was weird. It was like a period of about three months, and it was like just as quickly as it came, it went, and then so and I think probably my parents thought that it was just you know like a phase, a phase mm. because you know young people go you know you're hormonal and. 
You know, the thing is, it could have just been a phase. We what we everything we know about mental illnesses, like physical illnesses, they're very treatable if you catch them early, and if they're not, they kind of snowball and become bigger and bigger. Mm. And um, and as that was the case, and that, that's not any judgment of my parents, by the way. Um, it just wasn't something people's, and I didn't know it was a mental. illness. There was illness. no conversation around it. Well, no, people I people's minds I, weren't open to. But also, you know. I don't know. Like I look back, and I write about this in the book. There were lots of weird things. Like I remember genuinely, really believing that I might be pregnant <laughs> with an alien from you know that those Sigourney Weaver. Yeah. You know, like I was terrified that I had this strange thing inside me, and it was only really when I was writing Mad Woman that I thought, well, that's a bit. I mean, that was, and it was essentially. I remember my therapist saying, well, that was sort of a psychotic episode, and I think, God, like I was really unwell, but it was just. We didn't, you know, it, it just wasn't talked about. Mm. Um, and it was only years later it sort of came back when I was studying for my A-levels. You know, I can see the stress and the... and so this, just, just, just quickly, the period in between yeah. was relatively, from a mental health perspective... Calm. I mean, it was, yeah, I mean, it was yeah? like... Because you had a, yeah. It was, I mean, I was, I was quite, I was, I was, I was a well, <laughs> dare I say it, well-behaved, you know child like, yeah teenager but just with the normal kind of you know boyfriend trouble that kind of thing mm. and then at yeah about 17 just before my a-levels it came that came back and this time it was there was the worry about aids but there was also worry that i might have hurt someone and blanked out in horror and i started like reading newspapers to check that no one had been murdered or hurt in my like local area. I don't know what, and it was, and uh, yeah, and the and then I had I had a I had a much young I still have a much younger brother, and I was worried that I might have done something and hurt him and blanked it out in horror, and it was it was just horrible, and weirdly. And were they were those sort of thoughts that stayed with you? They were so or, were you, or were they periods where that's you, you're, you're having those, you know, oh, my God, have I killed someone? I need to check the papers. Uh, do you then sort of emerge from that into some... No, they were more or less solid. And I remember right. it was pretty awful. And it was, again, getting back to that thing of, like, I can't leave the house. And it's nightmarish. And then at the time, there was this film out. I mean, this is where it's so interesting, just, like, how lucky I feel at the time. There was this film out called As Good As It Gets. I don't know if you remember it. I do remember it. Jack it, yeah. Nicholson in it. Yeah, and he very kind of good film. Yeah. played OCD for laughs. Yeah, yeah. And he won an Oscar. And I remember he stepped over each, you know, he kind of went over each, you know. Couldn't walk on the cracks in the pavement. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And he played it for laughs. And The Guardian wrote this, had this big piece about OCD is actually very serious. And these are the way it manifests. And I remember my mum left it out for me. So she must have noticed something. And I remember reading it and reading about this type of OCD whereby you worried that you might have killed someone or hurt someone or done something terrible, molested someone. Um, and it talks about intrusive thoughts and this type of OCD called pure O. And it was like, I couldn't believe it. Like, I couldn't believe it. I was like, that's me. And um, the OCD being what we call the doubting disease, it then went, mm, but is it? Or are you using this as an excuse to like, right. you know, oh God, I just thinking about it makes me kind of tear up. And um, and I remember... And tear, you're, and tear up because you can still feel what you felt. Yeah, and it was like so yeah. terrifying. And, but I remember, I like I think also feeling really sad for that version of me that I kind of just thought I was weird and I was faulty and now I can see that I wasn't that I was I was just a very unwell child you know but it was like so do you look back at that period then as a missed opportunity because there are a number of things in your story where you could say well if things had gone differently yeah. you would have got you'd have reached the sort of level of self-awareness that you mm. have now a lot sooner. Yeah, of course. But, I mean, you can't... Like, I can't think like that because that isn't what happened. And, and in a way, I had to go through a lot of pain. But I've had an incredibly blessed life and I've encountered the most amazing things mm. and been able to experience the most amazing things because I did miss... Those opportunities were missed. So you're ultimately an optimist, aren't you? 
<laughs> I'm wearing a T-shirt saying it. I'm not. I'm actually <laughs> ultimately a pessimist. Like, my default setting, really? when I wake up, like, this morning, Andy, and, like, every morning I wake up and I go, how can I not do the things I'm planned to do? Because okay. I'm... And, and when you go to bed... I feel much more optimistic. I'm like, phew, I got through another day, but I'm in fear. I'm in constant fear. Like, the well, you, catastrophe well, is right. just around the corner. Right. And that, I think, is something that is quite, you know, for people with a with a background of mental health issues, is quite normal. Like, that kind no, of... of course, of course. The fear and it's, of and, it's, and, it's, and also, trying to apply you are, right, is a nonsense conversation anyway, <laughs> isn't it, in a way, right? Because yeah. we're all a number of different things. Yeah. But, but... To, 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 to say in one sentence, as you just did, you know, I'm not going to look back and be bitter about the missed opportunities um, yeah. with my diagnosis and with other things that have happened during the course of your life. I'm not going to be bitter about the fact that a door that should have been open to me actually remained shut. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just going to look back at it and say, do you know what? It was tough and it was difficult and we're going to hear about just how tough and difficult, yeah. you know, as we, as we talk. But that, that could take you into a really dark place. That could absolutely tip you towards bitterness. And it hasn't. And that's what I mean about you being optimistic. Yeah, but I can't... I'm not... I'm not... There's no... I don't have the luxury of that. As a, mm. as someone with a history of mental illness, as an alcoholic in recovery, as all these things, I don't have the luxury of dwelling in misery. Mm. Because the moment I do that, I am, pardon the technical language, fucked. Mm. You know, like the moment I start down that path, it, it, I'm not get, you know, I'm, I'm going to a very dark place, as you said. So I've learned, this is something I've had to learn. I can choose to focus on the negatives or I can choose to focus on the positives. And when I choose to focus on the positives, I'm, you know, it's hard. It's not something that comes naturally to me, but I definitely, you know, end up feeling a lot better for it. Um, and my brain, as I said, it will... My brain, like, if you think about... You know in movies where The Rock has to defuse a bomb, you know, and it's like... I've said The Rock just because I'm obsessed with The Rock, but like, anyway, you know, some action hero. Mm -hmm. And he said, you've got the, the wires are... You know, the wires are connected. Yeah, don't cut the wrong colour. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I feel like... I was born with the, my my wires, the colours were wired the wrong way, right? So I wake up and I want to go back to bed and I want to hide and I think something terrible is going to happen that day. Like, that is instinctively how I feel. It's how I feel right now. It's how I feel today. You know, when, when I'm in when I'm in, like, book promo or whatever and the eyes are on me, I'm like, something terrible is going to happen. I can't just enjoy life because mm. that's just the kind of mindset of someone with a history of mental illness. So I have to do, from the moment I wake up, it's like, what can I do to make, to kind of prove that wrong? And that, every day, that is my, that is my battle. And that is my, um, that's, I have to kind of employ a lot of little things to kind of show that that's not actually the case because every day until today of my life, Nothing, you know, like... It... These are strategies that you're running in your mind to keep yourself... <laughs> yeah, you but know. the impending doom hasn't happened because I'm still here and I'm talking yeah. to you, you know, and the world is still spinning. And not just the world is spinning. You've created <sighs> brilliant work. You've made a proper difference to people's lives. Even if we just look at mental health mates, mm. that has had a, a ripple effect across God knows how many lives, families, individuals. It's, are you able to kind of feel proud? Sometimes, yeah. I think I'm getting to that point where I go, oh, yeah, look, you've done... You've done enough. <laughs> you don't have to, you know, you don't have to prove that you're a decent person. I think yeah. sometimes a lot of my work is about proving I'm not a bad person because that's what OCD does. It tells you, you know, it wants you to think you're the worst person in the world. And I'm just objectively not the worst person in the world. <laughs> You know, you and I both know there are far worse. But also, for me, it's about going, life is kind of, it's more nuanced than that. And we live in this very binary, almost like, we, you know, we don't we don't live in the Marvel universe where you have goodies and baddies. Do you know what I mean? It's me, it's learning that there are bits of me that are bad, and that's okay. Mm. 
Yeah, of course. Because we're all flawed and we yeah. all fuck up. Yeah. So I'm like feeling like a total idiot for saying you're an optimist, even though, frankly, you've walked into a with a T-shirt with a ring <laughs> on. So I've obviously <laughs> absorbed it sort of sub subliminally. No, but this is my. <laughs> but 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 isn't it also the case though that that of all of those things that you're wrestling with every day, you know, one of those things is also an optimist, right? Because mm. that, 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 that's, and that's what I'm interested in talking about that with you because the resilience is unbelievable, you know, in your story. It's self-evident and, and unbelievable. Layers of these crises that you still manage to punch through. Mm. So isn't that part of you as valid as the other, as the other more difficult yeah. you know, voices that you're wrestling with? I haven't thought about that. That's a nice thing to think of. But I am rest. Yeah, we are all many parts of many different things. Yeah. And essentially, I guess internal family OCD, system. I can't Schwartz, isn't it? Who I guess that? I think it's, that's that's the idea. I think, isn't it? That well, all of these things are acknowledging all of e your and equally valid. Yeah. Yeah. And I think OCD is, as you know, like in in an ideal world, I sorry for my. My phone, my Apple Watch is telling me to stand up and move around. That doesn't help. <laughs> I mean, feel free. It's all right. I'm quite comfortable. <laughs> um, OCD is like a mechanism of checking, of checking that you're safe, I think. Yeah. And fundamentally, inside me, there's a brownie that, that knows that I'm safe, but needs to just, just double check, you know? Mm. I'm saying more than safe, though. I'm saying brilliant. Oh, thanks. That's because, very kind. Because it's, well, it's evidence. Never mind, in my opinion, it's perfectly evident. The book, your book being the latest example. Anyway, let's move on. I um, I think I'm right in saying that after that initial bout of OCD, your symptoms faded. Well, they faded for a few years, sorry. After the, after the return of the OCD, I should say, that it faded again post-A-levels. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. It didn't stay continual thereafter. Well, I guess it's always been a sort of ticking thing, like a sort of like a... <laughs> It's like a Dido album at a dinner party, you know, just quietly in the background. And then it's kind of come in and out over 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 the years in different ways, you know, with different with differing intensity. So give me an example of when it really hit hard again. Um well throughout my twenties I was working at um well I still am working at the Telegraph. And it was always it was just kind of there, you know, it was like but I guess because I, by that point, I discovered alcohol and drugs. And boy, oh boy, did they help me to motor forward for a while there. You know, it was like, that was how I, I sort of sh shut the voice. I shut the voice of, um, I shut that sort of questioning voice out every night by just getting on it and be, becoming gregarious, fun briny, you know. And... Um, and do, do you now I... understand that to have been a sort of slightly chemical thing as well? I mean, obviously you were taking drugs, so obviously it was yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And, and drinking. Yeah. But you remember that period now as, oh, oh okay, it actually just sort of worked very directly, right? If yes. If I go out and get hammered, I'm just not going to have to, and that voice is going to disappear. Yes. And also... And it, was that, it was that sort of straightforward. For and you. All, Yeah, so it was like putting on a sparkly dress and being like, I can be the person I've always wanted to be who who, who has no self-doubt and has all this confidence and can go and be this sparkling human, you know. And, and it did, and I always say this with alcohol, like, it worked really fucking well until it stopped working, you know, until it didn't. And I'm sort of grateful to alcohol and drugs in a way for that because I don't think I would have... I d sometimes there are points where I look at... In the, in the years since I've got sober, right... When I got sober, my the year that I kind of went to the depths of my alcoholism, my career had never been higher. Mm. Okay? Well, you had these two things running yeah. in parallel, and that's not what we that's not what we stereotypically view an alcoholic. We think that you know when someone is forced to their rock bottom, they're sitting on a park bench with a, yeah. you know, with a with a paper bag, and that wasn't what. It was like for me. I've jumped ahead here, but I, you know, I was. I'd interviewed Prince Harry. I'd run a marathon. It was great, and I realised there's a point now where I realised that actually, maybe I needed <laughs> to be that drunk to push myself that high, because those these industries, as you know, Andy, are not fucking easy no. to um, manoeuvre, you know, and they require a sort of an almost inhuman kind of 
amount, you know, an ability to kind of to navigate them and to force your way to the top. Mm. They it, require energy. They require resilience. Mm, they require, but, no, but, they were, but they also require professionalism, right? So mm. you were you were you were also managing somehow to because you weren't you know there's a, there's a reason why you were successful as a columnist, no, right? No, but the, pro the professionalism, yes, they require all of that. But they also require an element of your energy that actually now I look I look and think I don't know if that's healthy healthy yeah, yeah. sure no for, of course it wasn't and it was a moment in time different yeah attitudes I suspect even and also you were around news right continually yeah so having heard how you'd absorbed things as a uh, difficult messages and uh, also difficult stories or from a film even you talked about alien yeah right you're you're around you're in a newsroom you're yeah. you know you're surrounded by adrenaline actual kind of catastrophe and crisis you're in the business of it people thrive on it people thrive on it like, I mean, ooh, like ooh, and some i always remember when something terrible happened you know like some some you know some big event people would kind of prick up and get you know almost in a newsroom they'd almost get excited so what 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 was that how did that kind of react you know how did that sort of what response what, what impact did that have on you well i wasn't ever in a newsroom really you i was on features, i was on yeah. the cots in in what we'd refer to as the cotswolds <laughs> It was never called is, that. It was never is, called that in the sun, I can the, tell you. The but, new, the I get the point. I remember someone at the Telegraph <laughs> saying the newsroom was Baghdad and the features was the features was the, the Cotswolds. <laughs> and I think, well, we you know, can get it can get dark here in the Cotswolds. <laughs> Here in Chipping Norton. Yeah, but, um, exactly, exactly. <laughs> but um, so I never, you know, I was never, I was never kind of that. I was always, I was always too a bit too. It's just the, my point. My point, badly put, is that <laughs> given what you've described as your Ooh. challenges, right, yeah. uh, to be in that environment, yeah. albeit on the Cotswold end of it. <laughs> but again, right? because I suppose it's it still, is. It's still, it's it's like, you know, it's a, it's interesting that that's where you were, well, right? And it's interesting also that that's where you thrived. I suppose, because you did. I suppose also, yeah, there is like, when you work at a newspaper, it's like, look, there is catastrophe every fucking day, you know, impending doom all over the world, you know, sort of proves that little voice in your brain right. Yeah, yeah. Can we backpedal a little bit? Yeah, we can, because sorry. Because I've, 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 I've uh, gone off I've the, I've... No, I've skimmed over an important an important moment because... In addition, I think you're you're 17, there or thereabouts. You also start suffering from alopecia. Oh yeah. Um, I'm right, about 17. Yeah. Sort of, well, know. my hair started falling out, which I guess was the stress of of thinking I was a serial killing paedophile. So if I explain OCD, because I, that's the real, you know, I describe OCD as your brain refusing to acknowledge what your eyes can see. So that your hands are clean or the oven is off or the hair straighteners are unplugged or whatever. And there's an element of it, puro, this subset, which is about thoughts. So we all have thousands of thoughts a day. We are not our thoughts. And we've all had that thought, you know, um, what if I just threw this baby on the floor if some, when someone hands it to you at a party or on the tube? What if I just push someone in front of the tube and and yet most of us go well no obviously i'm not going to do that and we just dismiss it and mm. get on with the deck with our day someone with pure o will be so distressed by their thought that they will ruminate on the thought again and again to prove they are not the thought and that's the kind of ocd i had and so Obviously, people, you know, when people say to me, oh, I'm a bit OCD, you should see my sock drawer. And I, I want to no, kind of wallet no. them over the head, not that I resort to violence. Um, because that's not, uh, you know, my husband always jokes, I wish you had the good type of OCD. <laughs> so I'm kind of feral and a mess at home. There is no good type of OCD. But um, that was torturous. And obviously, people don't talk about it. Um, and it was only much late, it's only been later in my life that I've been able to, to talk about this kind of stuff openly like this. Mm. But the stress of that, I really do believe in my hair, yeah, my hair fell out. So I look, I look sort of like Bobby Charlton with a comb over at the age of 17, which is not I mean, a great not, look. Uh, not a great age either no. to be facing that kind of no. trauma. I mean, that must have had a very significant impact on your self esteem. Um, I think it did. It was it was kind of, but it also kind of made sense to me. It was like, 
well, my outside reflects my inside. You know, like things weren't right. And also, if you have, you know, like... That's a very smart insight for a 17-year-old girl. But also, if you have big patches on your head, you look unwell and people take you seriously. And that sounds awful, but, like, there's still that notion that mental health issues are not serious, you know, Mm. and... We have sympathy for someone who has a physical illness, but not necessarily a mental illness. So I think there was a little bit of relief in me. Which it was kind of showing. Yeah. It was a demonstration of what you were going through. Yeah. Right. And I don't know. So if did that... that cause? Did that cause? You know, uh, obviously your family, but the medical professionals that are around you that that led to helpful interventions, did it? No, not at all. No, they were a bit like. Well, I remember my mum. It was. The first time I'd seen my family go, oh, God, she really is unwell. And that's not, again, this isn't like Mm, a judgment of mm. them. It was, you know, it was just so evident. And I remember my mum taking, my mum tried, you know, she would do everything to try and help me, you know, but there was just no structure out there to Mm. help me. Um, And still isn't to a certain extent. And I remember her taking me to the doctor and the doctor sort of looked at me and was like, with a way that was like, there are actual really ill people out there, you know, you're being a bit vain. So again, there was that element. Um, But yeah, I don't, you know, I've still, my, I kind of, there's, I have a sort of gratitude to my hair because still to this day, it's a sort of way of me measuring how, like I've got patches or, you know, I always have like a patch here or there and I have a few patches right now and it's a kind of, it's a good measure of of how stressed I might be, you know. Like I, I, three months after a stressful event, a patch will appear somewhere. Right, so it serves as a kind of reminder. Yeah, a sort of, bit like, come on, Bryony, <laughs> a bit of self-care is required here. Yeah, yeah. I just, optimist is not the right word. We've discussed that and I won't go back there. It's all right, we can go... We but can there, is a, there is a... I don't know what the word is, but here's another example, right? You say I'm grateful for for the issues that I had with alcohol. I'm grateful for the alcohol, yeah. Pisha. You're certainly a grateful individual, but that's that, for sure. But, but that is because you, solidly because of sobriety. Yeah. And having a programme. Yes. A 12-step programme. Yeah, and you've been able to get there. Yeah. And you've been sober now for... Nearly seven nearly years. Nearly seven years, yeah. yeah. Congratulations. Thanks. Um, let's move forward with the story. Yeah. Um, um, you've done some um, incredible work advocating for body acceptance. Um, we've touched on it already. Your marathon running. Um, I mean, you run the uh, London Marathon in your underwear in 2018. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, you've also spoken about how Instagram has been a very useful tool for you. Um but you've also had a lot of criticism, a lot of hate on social media, right? Yeah, well... How, how, did, how did... It's obviously net positive. You see it as net positive, right? For sure. I don't... I get... It's re- interesting. I don't get... I get a lot of love on Instagram. I most... That, I mean, it's 99% love. Yeah, on other... But... Through, through other platforms. Um, through other way. platforms, so, yeah. So how did you... How do you deal with that? Um, I mean, there's not a lot of it, as much as there was, I suspect, at certain N- points. No, there's still a lot of it. There's still a lot of it. And I think that, I mean, I get a lot. I get, I, you know, just the other week, I had the most terrible email from someone that just was talking about how disgusting I was. Um, and there's a lot of judgment, like a lot of people who are uh, like this they say this running challenge is a terrible way to lose weight and I, well it's not it's not a way it's not a way for me to lose weight it's um it's something completely different than that and yeah there's a lot of i think that a lot of women get who are in the public eye and i'm not that public but you know wh- who step onto mainstream media um platforms get a lot of abuse that is sort of normalized and and i 
really use it as fuel and as a sign that I need to carry on doing more of what I do. And I have to be, the way I deal with it is I have to be really mindful that these people are not representative of most people, even though they look like it in a comment section. Mm. And they're loud. Because they're louder mm. and they shout everyone else out. Yeah. And then, so it's like the bullies, the bullies kind of think that they're... Well, it is, yeah. And, um, and I have to remember that that's not actually indicative of 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 people and you know most people and did that take you a while to work out i mean in the first sort of phase of you you know getting those kind of emails those kind of messages how what was the, what was the instinct given the yeah no it's still it, it still is it's still something i really have to tell myself because it's still not it, you know you see these messages and you think god everyone hates me of course, people, most people aren't fucking thinking about me, Andy. Of course, what I mean? no, it's all about them. <laughs> and in, 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 in a, you know, we're newspaper people. Um, yeah. You know, this is pre-tech. You know, you know, changes in technology. These would have been letters written in green ink. They would have been letters and, and but sent in. Right? I do so think. It's, I do think there's a. I do think it's really interesting where we go next because obviously the comments underneath, you know, on newspaper websites create a sort of. Mm engagement but i don't think you can i also think that they can when they get nasty which is the case with, you know on any newspaper mm. with any women woman that is that is what happens and i just think it's gross and i think there needs to be some sort of you know these are things that people people who in real life would never ever dream of saying something and they're probably very well brought up you know yeah. but there's something about the internet and that space that turns well it gives permission and it's a platform and it allows people yeah. to broadcast um in a way that they didn't have before where are you on the impact of technology on young minds obviously you're a mum of a young daughter yeah I where, think... where 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 are you on that I think that in 20 years' time, we'll look back on the way we use phones and social media in the same way we look back at adverts for smoking. <laughs> you know, yeah, or maybe not wearing a seatbelt. Yeah, yeah, I think we'll be like, yeah. ooh, I cannot believe we all used these devices with absolutely no boundaries. I have to be really careful myself. I think... I can talk all I want about not giving my daughter a phone, but if I'm on my phone the whole time, it doesn't make the slightest bit of difference, you know? Because you tell her it's work. I'm, you know, I've, yeah, I've got, got to do this. Who cares? That's I've what got to she's do seeing. It. It's, it's my work, yeah. So I really have to be very... But also for my own mental health, if I'm looking down and inwards, I'm not in a good place, you know, or constantly. I want to be looking up and out because actually the real world is out there and... It's not in my phone, you know. Mm. So I think it has some amazing positives. So it has enabled people to, you know, the mainstream media have been forced by social media to use a variety, you know, to, to you know, to, to basically embrace diversity, you know, in a way that they would absolutely not have done mm. were it not for social media. Mm. Um, and I think that's fucking brilliant. Um, so that's great. But I, I think the 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 sort of addictive elements of it, and these things are absolutely designed to be addictive in the mm. same way that cigarettes were, mm. is where we have to be a bit careful because they, you know, the, the kind of likes and, you know, seeing things like how many views a video has got or... No, it's, 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 these it's, are all, the, whole, the whole thing is... is, is, is uh, they're all working is, on... It's addictive in a way that perhaps other things, even more so... You know, then... Well, they're all working on the same dopamine receptors. They are, they are, they are. What do we do about it? I've got no idea. I think we talk about it. You know, we keep talking about it. And I'm not going to... My daughter's not going to have a phone until she's in year eight. Mm. And then it'll be a dumb phone. Yeah, yeah. Which is that idea is getting pace, is getting, um, yeah. is getting momentum, isn't it? If you, um, if you were your daughter's age... Yeah. Um... And you'd had the same reactions, which you, you know, obviously you, you you will have done, right? That's for the sake of this argument, right? You're having the same experiences. You're having those same appalling moments as a young girl. Mental health issues. Mental health yeah. issues. Uh, uh, how do you think you would have coped in today's environment? Well, it's a difficult one. I think that 
there are they're much more educated about mental health. So on the one hand, you've got a higher level of, of education and awareness, yeah. right? But on the other hand, you've got a mini computer in your hand yeah. that is the possibly the most addictive thing that any of us have ever experienced. Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> so uh, what would that, have, how would that, I'm but, just I'm just thinking in terms I, of kids that are going through what you went through now. Yeah, I mean, I don't, on the one hand, they'll be able to seek out the information about it, but we know there's a lot of very, very, very dark stuff. So I don't know. I'm not 10. I feel mm. feel like I'm 10 some days, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Most days. But um, I, I think that there is much more awareness of it. And lots of people come to me, lots of parents come to me and they say, my child is experiencing OCD. I'm terrified. And I think if you're getting them help, you're going to be okay. Because I think we need to really, you know, we talk, you, this podcast talks about resilience, right? We need to accept that people will always experience mental health issues, right? And I cannot protect my child or anyone from experiencing mental health issues, right? These are, these are, these are sort of things that happen in our brain, you know, which are often entirely appropriate. My job is to hold my daughter's hand if those things happen and let her know that I love her, whatever, completely unconditionally. We spend a lot of time teaching children how to be happy. Actually, what we need to do is be teaching children how to be sad mm. because these are inevitable things. Yeah. You know, like, we, we spend so much time focusing on happiness. And obviously, happiness is great. I'm not going to tell you, Andy, that happiness is overrated. I would love to be happy all the time, but I don't live in cloud cuckoo land, right? Mm. I'm also going to be angry. I'm going to be depressed. I'm going to be sad. And all of these things are feelings. They're not failings, yeah. you know. Yeah. And what we need to do more is, is instill in our children, you know, instead of saying, don't cry, don't be silly, sit down and go, well, maybe you do need to have a cry. Should we talk about why you feel like this? Yeah. And this is how we, this is how we make people resilient. We don't, we don't stop them from feeling what they're going to feel. We yeah. sit there with them through it and yeah. allow them to feel these things. All of my problems in life have come from trying not to feel what I'm feeling, from dismissing my essential, like, human responses to things. All of my problems have come from that. So we had Anthony Seldon on, Sir Anthony Seldon. Oh, I love who's, him. Yeah, who's, I think you're just... He's a know, wise man. You are, uh, you are absolutely aligned he had a, how didn't, we should he be approaching this. teach... He had a, when well, he was, he was the kind of creator of happiness lessons as they got branded, but actually yeah. they weren't about happiness, they were no. about resilience. They, he is exactly the argument that you've just made. He is a, is a, is a brilliant man. So, there, you know, there is good stuff going on in schools. Uh, whether there's enough of it, of course, is, a, is, a, is another matter. Can we just talk very quickly about your work ethic? Because I mentioned it in the intro. And I know you're going to say to me, well, it was another... It was another device for me. You're at work as an outlet for me. As long as I was busy, I was able to yeah, go. Yeah, but yeah. you've also just got an unbelievable work ethic. <laughs> I don't know. Right? So where does that? Well, you well, look, look I, at the look a fear, at the... a fear of being called lazy. Mm. Because when I was because when I was drinking and using drugs, is I would... it just about that, or I... is a work ethic? Can you also trace your? Because your mum's pretty hardworking too. Is there not? Is there not just? Is that? Is that not just a simpler route from your from your childhood, seeing a mother who worked very hard? Who well, was, I think, in, I, yeah, and I your think, dad as well, I'm sure. I but. think that there is a sense as well that if you're busy, like I've been thinking about this a lot. I was talking to someone yesterday because I've worked like a, I've worked very hard over the, the last couple of you know, especially hard over the last couple of months, bringing a book out and doing a book tour and everything. And sort of got to this weekend and I had to run 16 miles with a head cold. And I sort of, sort of, yesterday morning woke up and was like, I'm not feeling great. And I spoke to someone very wise, a friend of mine, and she said, you know, sometimes, Brian, the challenge is to be still. <laughs> and I thought, oh, yes, that's true. The challenge is to do nothing and mm. to say no. Mm. And I people please a lot, right? So... For me, I think there is an element of workaholism, right? And if I'm if I'm being really successful and if I'm pleasing people at work, then I'm okay, you know. And that works to some extent, but there's a point where you your body goes, "Can we just have a lie down here, please, Bryony?" You know. Yeah. yeah. And I think for me, it is you know I think a lot of us 
I grew up with that, that, that notion that busyness equals success. You know, and I'm starting to question that a bit now in my 40s mm. because I do want to lie down a bit more. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you're also driven by productivity, aren't you? There's someone else very wise said to me, I know balance. I swing past it every day as I go from one extreme to the other. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to spit. <laughs> um, um, that's me very much. So, look, there's a we're skipping through this, but there are other layers, you know, that are and, and they are, you know, it's not one to the other. These things are overlapping sometimes in parallel. But um, uh, uh, bulimia was a significant and difficult part of your life for, mm. uh, for a period of time as well. Just to explain when that emerged and 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 how it developed. So bulimia, I think it was it was my late teens, my twenties, a lot of my twenties. But I think you know, I honestly didn't see it as particularly unusual, and 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 I and I, and I actually, I think that. You know, the more I think about eating disorders and the more I think about the diet culture that pervades in this country and has done for a long time, and we think we're getting better at it, but it sort of dresses itself up a bit. Mm. I think it's amazing that women, if, you know, if a woman has ever had a period of eating normally, you know, because... It's so, and we know that eating disorders are not about weight. You know, they are not weight issues. They are soul issues, you know. Mm. But in a world that tells you that you need to look a certain way, they are um, as good a way as any to try and exert some control over a life that feels quite uncontrollable. And I definitely thought, you know, if I was smaller, I would, you know, I would be more attractive and I would be better and... I knew from a young age, I, I'd known from a young age, I'd intuited that I, I liked food and that was not a great thing. <laughs> you know, it was not good to like food. I, mm. I saw everywhere I looked, there were people on the cabbage soup diet, the Cambridge diet, you know, and there was Jane Fonda and going for the burn and these were all really normal things. And, um, and I was aware that food was sort of bad, but I really liked it guess what you know <laughs> and so yeah that sort of and that I was supposed to look a certain way and I remember from a young age hearing you know I remember saying to this woman in my family when I was I must have been about 14 and I was tiny you know and I remember going oh do you, do you think I could do with losing a bit of weight and I remember her saying oh we could all do with losing a bit of weight and you know, I look back and think, God, that was that was that was the culture most women my age grew up in, and mm. you know, Rome was not built in a day, and it's very hard to unpick that. And so, you know, yeah, bulimia, it was just another thing, another way of me trying to take some and for control. how and for how long? I'd say a good ten years, a decade. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right, and um. I think probably it sort of started to dwindle out as, I guess, my cocaine use um, ramped up. I would say so. I think so. There's an overlap with what you've described yeah. as your as your decade of chaos. Yes. Which is the drinking, which is the cocaine. Yeah. And is the full on kind of you know I'm just going to be someone else to escape from. Yeah, like you know, just sort of. CD. I, I'm now. I hesitate to even describe them as romantic <laughs> relationship or even relationships. I mean, you wrote a you brilliant know. book about it. Well, I mean, I. When did you last read that book? The wrong knickers. Yeah. Oh God, I haven't. Re I haven't. I haven't read it for ten years, and I. Couldn't, you wrote it, put it out there, never went back to it. Never went back to it. I couldn't because it is the most astonishing kind of. I. Uh, it's, it's a. It's a. An, as an exercise in. <laughs> sort of, you know, uh, a, a self-exposure, if I could put it that way. <laughs> yeah, but I was... I mean, it's, it's brilliant, and it was a huge success, and I can absolutely see the part it played mm. in your, in your, you know, horrible word, journey. Um, but it's interesting to me that you haven't gone back to it at all. 
No, I would cringe. But also, listen, every book I've written has been about, I wrote that. I mean, I wrote that. I literally had a tiny baby in mm. my arms. I signed the contract two weeks after my daughter was born. And I was like, I thought I was in a different world, you know? I was mm. like, well, I'm not. I'm safe. I have this nice husband. I have a flat in Clapham. I have a baby. I have a bugaboo, you know? And I wanted to let other women who felt a bit chaotic in their 20s feel, you know, like there was hope. Mm. You know, and for me at the time, hope was a husband <laughs> and a child. And obviously that that has changed. And there's a kind of cringe element there. But I, I, uh, I thought I was, you know, there was an element of, well, I was through that so I could write about it. And of course, little, I mean, I was, little did I know, I wasn't really through it. I wasn't through the drinking and the drugging, you know, but, um, yeah, it was, it's a, but also it's, you know, it's just a true reflection of what my 20s, my 20s were awful. You know, they were really chaotic. Um, and I sort of turned them into a, it was a sort of like performance, but I'm not going to say art, I'm not going to say performance <laughs> art. But I, I did, you know, there was a good way of like, oh, this terrible thing's happened. I'll turn it into a joke and make people laugh the next day. Probably while I'm still high, you know. And then in the next, so you write the book. It's, a, yeah. it's an enormous success. Yeah. Your profile raises. Yeah. Right. You're, you're, you're building a brand for yourself yeah. very successfully. But there's an awful lot of other stuff going on. Yeah. And that you're not talking about, that you're not writing about. Yeah, the OCD, namely. Yeah, exactly. So how how were you? Mm. How was that impacting you? The it's... fact the fact that you'd kind of got out there, that you knew that there was an awful lot more the A that you were dealing with, and, and but it wasn't even you know like I don't think these are kind of conscious decisions. You know, mm. you're just like it didn't occur to me that anyone would want to read about OCD. Mm. You know, like, why would anyone want to read about this weird part of me? Mm. They don't want to know about that. And I remember about six months after the book came out, having just a complete, you know, the OCD had come back and it was the worst this time because it was like, maybe you've hurt your daughter. And I remember being at work, I remember being in the Telegraph offices and I was drinking, I mean, I wasn't drinking in the Telegraph offices, but I was, you know, my way to deal with it was like to open a bottle of wine, and then, you know, once my ba once my daughter was asleep and just sort of like, so I was kind of perpetually hung over. And I remember just being at my desk and just starting to cry because it was so tormenting. You know, my brain was like, what if you hurt your child? And, and I was like, I can't do this anymore because this is now not just about me, it's about someone else. And I'm... And I wrote a column about this type of OCD and bless the Telegraph for publishing it, you know, because it was, you know, looking back, kind of quite a brave thing to do. Because I remember thinking, well, it'll, I'll put it down in, on, you know, in writing and either the police will come and get me and then it's just done, do you know what I mean? And they'll lock me away for the rest of my life or they won't and people, will get, other people who have this type of OCD will get in touch. Mm. And um, I'll know I'm not mad or I am mad but I'm not bad and that was what happened like I couldn't believe it in droves like hundreds and hundreds of telegraph readers uh message saying me too and if not OCD then some other form of mental illness and I remember there was a sort of 78 year old woman who got in touch and was and said I read your column and I realized this is what I've had my whole life and I knew then it was like it's you know the most normal thing in the world to feel weird but i knew then that that was something i i didn't i mean i didn't know that it was going to set me off on this other path i had no idea i remember my publishers going you should write a book about ocd and i was like really <laughs> and i did you know and and that was that so before then though you still got a lot more to get through yeah and and you know as the profiles r rising yeah as the you know your 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 i think by then obviously you I assume you started your uh, you started your charity. You started mental yeah. health mates. Um, you know, you're interviewing Prince Harry. Your podcast is flying. Yeah. Um, but you're still dealing with the with the OCD. But you're also dealing still with the uh, alcohol. Yeah. Um, tell me how that kind of, try try and give us an idea of when you when you sort of hit bottom, if you like. So I think so. I wrote Mad Girl. I wrote about OCD, and I was kind of really catapulted into this world of mental health activism and you know 
as I was doing that, I was realizing, as I was meeting people, I was realizing your drinking is not normal. Like you cannot, you know, listen, alcoholism we know is an illness of, you know, most mental illnesses are illnesses of denial. They're like, you don't have this illness, you're just a dickhead. Mm. Do you know what I mean? That's what they say. And that's what my brain was, you know, it was like, you're not an alcoholic. You're, and I spent a lot of my life trying to prove I wasn't an alcoholic. And, and essentially, what it boils down to, Andy, was there came a point where I was like, it's just easier to accept I am one. <laughs> you know, there were some properly dark moments. No, there as were well, some really right? dark moments. Yeah. I mean, I was going, and I knew. I think my career was like that. So I remember, and I've written about this, interviewing Prince Harry, and then going on this bender, and like, what just happened? You know, like, what did he just tell me? What's going on? And I was taking cocaine and I was telling strangers about this. And I remember sort of coming home the next day and my husband being like, where the fuck have you been? And you are going to destroy your career if you carry on like this. And I knew that, you know, I knew that. So while this big thing was happening, I was like, I'm a fraud. I'm a terrible human being because I'm talking about openness about mental health. And yet I'm behaving like an absolute, you know, I don't know, like an alcoholic. And I knew, I remember running the marathon for Heads Together, which was the um, William and Catherine and Harry's mental health mm. thing. And then, I mean, quite soon after being like, I need to get, this is not, I can't do this anymore. I can't do this. There was an appalling uh, incident as well at a friend's 40th birthday, right, yeah. that you've written about. Yeah, where, well, yeah, where I... You know, I came, I sort of came to, and there was a man, you know, it was something I shouldn't have been doing. And I can't, you know, like I don't, I find it, I, I don't know if I, I wouldn't have written that book now, you know, I kind of talking about that stuff is. Of course. But I know it's helped a lot of other people because this shit happens, like life gets dark, and either we want to help people. Mm who find themselves in these kind of situations and we want to help them move into the light or we don't. So I was, I made a de decision to write about that incident whereby I woke up and there was, I came to and I, there was a man with his head between my legs and, you know, and I was like, and this man had been giving me cocaine all night and I was like, I don't, did I, I probably told him that was fine, you know, and that was how low I'd got, you know. Goodness, bro. And yeah. that knowledge that there were people that knew more about me and what I'd been up to than I did because I was in blackout or I was high or I was, you know, and that was the sort of, that was, that was where alcoholism and addiction had taken me. And I had this knowledge, I was like, I knew, I'd started going, you know, I'd gone... About two years previously, I'd found myself going to an AA meeting in my lunch break. I'd like been sitting there and I'd Googled AA. <laughs> and, you know, you don't find yourself in an AA meeting by accident unless you've taken the wrong, a wrong turning to a church, church choir, you know, and I hadn't. <laughs> But I was like... But I you was, weren't engaging. I you was were, like, no, were, these were, people are right. not like me. I was like, who are these weird people that are being kind to me and smiling? They're happy. They can't be out. They can't be like me. But so I had this kind of... There's a no, There's a saying in recovery where you have, um, you know, a head full of... A beer full of belly and a head full of recovery. And they're very bad bedfellows, you know. Mm. And once you've, once you've gone, started going down that route, Drinking is just awful because you're like, I know I shouldn't be doing this. So I had, you know, I'd done a fair bit of going to meetings and things. And, um, yeah, it was about a week after that, 40th birthday party. And then I went out again and just, I was like, I knew I had to drink all of the alcohol and take all the drugs in London because it was like my time was up, basically. Well, if you do on a proper path to... Yeah, and I had this, like, crazy night. It wasn't even... It wasn't, you know, and I, again, went AWOL and it was not what a mother of a four-year-old should be doing. And um, and I remember coming home at about 10 in the morning and sitting on the end of my bed and being like, I can't do this anymore because if I, if I carry on, I'm going to die. I'm either going to die by choosing to take my own life or I'm going to die by choking on my own vomit or something or falling down, falling off a balcony or something, pissed. And you'd had those thoughts, but in, in particular in relation to taking your own life, you'd yeah. had those thoughts. Yeah, where it was like, this would be a better thing to do. 
And then, but all most worst of all, I was going to die by continuing to live in this like fucking Groundhog Day existence of mm. you know of shame. And um, I was really lucky. I was really lucky. I got to go to rehab, um, and I'm really lucky that I'm you know touch wood today still sober. It was the best thing I ever did. Well, again, hardest well, thing. Well, again, congratulations. Thanks. Um. Uh, when you released Glorious Rock Bottom in 2020, uh, which is, you know, the book about your relationship with alcohol and drugs, um, did you feel like you'd sort of finally um, revealed all of yourself to the world? Well, I had at that point, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, obviously the OCD story that is, that's here yeah. in more detail, was that a different... I don't know. Is, is, is at that point, what was your feeling about your degree of openness? I suppose because it was a, again another astonishing story and another astonishing thing to kind of yeah. But they're not. But you know, the there. thing is, actually, they're not that astonishing. These things happen to people all the fucking no, no, time. No, no, no. I know that. I know that. I appreciate. I appreciate. It's not unique. But it, I mean, guess what's um, unique the method, is the I... method. The method of delivery. Uh, right, uh, it, given and given what you're doing for a living and everything else that's going on is is, is fascinating, is what it but is. Guess... Right, it's incredibly brave. I use that word in the intro, and I meant it. Right, it's incredibly brave, but it's also, you know, it's complicated and fascinating as to why you, that's your sort of method of delivery. For whatever like. reason, I don't feel shame talking about this stuff. In fact, it's how I offload shame. Yeah. So I always remember someone in rehab saying to me, a counsellor saying, shame dies when you expose it to the light. And that is absolutely true. And for me, it's like, I, for whatever reason, and I'm sure there's many reasons, in fact, my mum's a journalist and, you know, no, this stuff doesn't feel unusual to me. And, and I know that that helps, you know? I know, it, I know, I know, I just know from my inbox and from the messages I get that this helps people. And that's all I, you know, it, it doesn't, people say to me, oh, what does your husband think? What does your daughter think? What does your, you know, and that's like what I hope my daughter will eventually think is, thank God my mum spoke about this dark stuff. That I know loads of people go through this. I am not actually that unusual. What I have listed in all of these books is not that unusual. It is quite a, I mean, it is unusual, you know, it is, but it is quite, you know, I am not the first alcohol, you know, alcoholic to, you know, I'm not the first person with obsessive compulsive disorder to have developed alcoholism and addiction as a way to cope with my mental illness, you know. This happens all over the world. This happens to people all of the fucking time. All of the time, Andy, people get into very dark, seedy situations because they've been drinking and taking cocaine. I'm, I'm absolutely aware. You know? And, and in, total, in a total agreement with you. And my, point, my point is that is the bravery, actually. Let's well, just settle on that word, shall we? Well, and yeah, you're going to be self-effacing again, so... But it's OK. But you're going to be self-effacing again, okay so let me... because I don't so do it me, anymore. Let me finish. Okay. <laughs> The bravery piece is what's fascinating to me, right? Because that is given everything that you've explained to us in terms of what's going, you know, the, the challenges that you're facing in, you know, in your own mind to then say, oh, okay, I'm going to get all that out there. Mm. I'm going to put all that out there, right? Is is fascinating and is incredibly brave. And we'll leave it there. Okay. Before you start disagreeing with me. <laughs> um, I'm skipping through and I'm doing it all with intent to a degree because people need to read this book. But one thing I do want to talk about before we finish is is another is another moment of crisis for you. Um, towards the end of 2022, you collapse in your kitchen, mm. and you later discover that you had an arrhythmia. Um, mm. Tell us what happened. What effect the discovery sort of has had on your outlook? Well, um, again, I think the interesting thing about that arrhythmia. <clears throat> Okay, it's a bit like the alopecia. I think it's a really fascinating way of my body telling me to slow the fuck down. Okay. So the the I realized like a lot of people during the pandemic I slipped into a depression, you know, and 
And it was the first time I'd had a de- I'd experienced a depression and felt that everyone else around me was depressed too. Mm. And I realized, it was the first time I realized, oh, this is quite, this is actually, it's appropriate. Depression is appropriate because we're all locked down, you know, our lives are on hold. And it was the first time I started to think about how a lot of mental health issues, rather than being, you know, you being a freak for having them, that maybe actually the the, the mad among us are actually the most sane. Their, react, their brains were acting appropriately to, you know, to things that are happening. Case in point being OCD and mums, you know, with newborns, you know, it's, it's a very elevated way of trying to keep the baby safe, you know. And I think that I... but. You know, you think, oh, a mental health campaigner who I I didn't I wasn't ready to acknowledge that I I I was in a bad place with depression and OCD again, and there was binge eating as well, and there was all sorts of things because I think I'd got to this stage where I was like, I can't I, people I need to look like I'm well, and if I don't look like I'm well, people are going to be like, oh, Bryony, we don't want to read about your mental health issues anymore. You know, we're bored of that. You've had that as if depression and OCD are like kind of mobile data that have a cap, you know, <laughs> reach that. And um, I think that the arrhythmia is going to sound really woo-woo and whatever, you know, I've said weird things, so it's okay, was is really my, was my body's way of going, mate, you're really not very well. You need to sort of back up a bit and look after yourself because I was really, I was really not well. I was very depressed. I had... Uh, the OCD had really got its teeth back into me. I was having all these hormonal issues, which I now see were early menopause, you know. Mm. And and uh, and so since then, I've you know the the arrhythmia was happening all the time back then, and it doesn't happen very often now. And the only time it does happen is when I'm going back into my old ways and sort of not looking after myself, taking too much, drinking too much coffee, taking too much coffee. That's like the hardest drug I do now, caffeine. (laughs) And it is a hard drug. Mm. Um, When I'm stressing, when I'm sort of getting into that sort of workaholic thing, Mm. that's when it will kind of kick up. Mm. And so I guess for me, it's that kind of, I just, I think life is fascinating and I, you know, there'll be, it's a constant journey without wanting to sound like a sort of X Factor contestant um, of learning. And I, I, the reason I wrote this book was because I wanted to show the messiness of recovery, partly, you know, because we need neat narratives, don't we? We like a neat narrative, like a neat beginning, middle and an end. And we want our books to be like that too. So I would love it that I'd just written Mad Girl I've got OCD and I'd found a cure for it and I'd walked off into the sunset and lived happily ever after. Unfortunately, life does not fucking work like that, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's what I wanted to show with Mad Woman. And there have been a couple of, like, you know, some quarters, the usual quarters that have criticised and going, oh, well, you know, that I have to be unwell to to have a successful career. And I don't think that's true. I think it's the opposite. Mm. It's in the constant realizing of these strange kind of coping mechanisms that my brain employs and sort of writing about them and calling them out that I get well you exactly know. exactly and, and, um, and it's you know <laughs> I'm going to finish by reading one uh, paragraph from your book so to set the scene this is towards the end of the book right and we don't want to give too much away so we want people to go and buy it and read it which everyone absolutely must do but you go to a retreat in Haywards Heath <laughs> and you are dancing. A somatic exercises, I think, is the way to describe it. I'm glad you picked this. Uh, I'm guessing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> with, a, with a group of other women. And you say this. Uh, objectively, I've never actually looked madder, but something dawns on me as I watch the other women holler and howl, and it is this. I am not mad. I've never been mad. The OCD... The alcoholism, the alopecia, the eating disorders, the depression, the endless fucking anxiety, they were all completely appropriate. They were my brain trying to show me what was wrong with my life. They were a complex response to a very simple truth that I have never accepted myself as I am. 
I think that's a really important paragraph. I think and, that's my favourite paragraph uh, of the whole book, so I'm oh, really well, glad you chose that. Well, great. Well, that's good. Sort of sums it up. That's you don't great. need to read any more of it. <laughs> it's an important paragraph, <laughs> but it's a very, very important story. And congratulations on the book. Congratulations thanks, on Andy. everything that you've done. Uh, you're amazing. Oh, um, thanks. And thank you for sharing it all with us, Bryony. Oh, it's been a pleasure. If you've enjoyed this conversation with Bryony, please do give us a rating and a review. It does help enormously. And if you hit subscribe, wherever you download your podcast from, you will find a lot more useful crisis conversations. You can follow us on Instagram and TikTok and you can watch the full episodes on YouTube. Just search for Crisis What Crisis Podcast. You can also find full transcripts of this and every episode we've recorded on our website, crisiswhatcrisis.com. Thanks so much for joining us. <laughs>